Good morning, beautiful people. I'm Babs Rawls Ivy, and you're listening to Love Babs Love Talk. And my guest today is Andy Tebow, writer extraordinaire, and really a prolific investigator. So we're going to have a wonderful conversation, rich conversation about um, um, his writing history, the books he's uh, authored, um, his website, cooljustice.com, and just about er everything that we could possibly um, get in this hour. So welcome, Andy. Thanks, Babs. Great to be here. Nice tunes. You have to put the mic right in front of you. Well, how's that? Like a kiss, almost. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me tell you how I don't really know. I don't know Andy Tebow, but because I spend a lot of time on social media and I am the uh, editor in chief of the inner city newspaper here, I manage the uh, Facebook and Twitter feed for the inner city news. And so Andy sent me something that he was working on or had worked on because I had responded to something and he sent it to me. And then we just sort of had this back and forth kind of engagement. You know, he'd send me information. I'd pass it on. I'd read it. And then we connected again on LinkedIn. And so I thought, Ooh, he would be wonderful to talk to. So I know of you because of the Bonnie Forshaw case. And Bonnie Forshaw is this African-American woman who went to prison for 27 years for murder of someone that she did not know. And everyone felt like she should have gotten manslaughter. And you got involved. How? Well, um, I've known Bonnie for about 10 or 12 years. And I first met her at the Nyanic Jail, the women's prison they call York. And, and at a writing workshop conducted by Wally Lamb. Yes. A novelist. Mm -hmm. uh, two time uh, Oprah guest. Yes. <laughs> two time or more New York Times bestseller. And a really nice person. He had been called into the jail uh, because there was a very high suicide rate at the time. And as Bonnie explained in a recent appearance, um, that gave the women uh, a venue to uh, let things out or discuss their trauma in small groups and look to other ways out besides uh, suicide. So I, I attended uh, one of these writing workshops after the women push, published their first uh, book called Couldn't Keep It to Myself. Yes, I have. Somebody sent me that book. Right. Someone sent that to me. And I can't remember if I was there after it was published or shortly before, but the state of Connecticut responded in a punitive manner uh, to this book of redemption and coming to terms with your life. And, and, and in this process, they had worked to rehabilitate themselves and show remorse and just try to to grow as human beings, but they uh, su sued all the women uh, for the cost of their incarceration. Really? So they wanted um, literally millions of dollars from a couple of them, and 60 Minutes got involved, and uh, one woman uh, r writer, uh, prisoner, commented after she got out, well, if I knew it cost so much, I wouldn't have stayed there so long. <laughs> but but uh, after the 60 Minutes broadcast, the state of Connecticut uh, rewrote a law, uh, withdrew, withdrew the suit uh, because they finally recognized it was a rehabilitative effort, not a money-making effort like I made money from my getting away with the or crime. Or do you think they were embarrassed by their Well, it's a combination of things. They, uh, because some of the people involved are, have been helpful to the program since that time. I like to think of it as they saw the light. Okay. <laughs> but, but there were a few backflips going on after 60 Minutes got involved. Now, you and Bonnie are friends because I see you all speaking and doing engagements and sort of... Right. We're... Um, We've made a couple appearances. We were at Gateway in New Haven uh, last year, thanks to 
Professor Franz Dusky, who's a real good guy and a poet and writer, and the wonderful library staff there. Uh, they're pretty cool, the uh, librarians at Gateway. But you were really instrumental in raising the awareness of her case. Well, I, I started to look into it, and she had had some lawyers who had been with her pretty much the whole time, uh, decades, uh, Mary Werblin, one of them. And um, the, the basic story of Bonnie was that uh, as a youngster, she grew up in Miami. Uh, she's uh, originally from Jamaica, and her mother had been in an abusive relationship, and Bonnie was abused, molested, and, and worse as a young person. Uh, she contracted some uh, disease from that and had a, a kid. And then when she moved up north, uh, ultimately she uh, was a union rep in a factory, supported her kids, and um, had been involved in three abusive uh, marital relationships where in one of them she was literally hit on the head with a baseball bat and suffered neurological damage. And after work one night, she was going to bring a friend home. They had a, a beer at the Jamaican Progressive League Club in Hartford. Uh -huh. And a, a guy was trying to pick her up, and she wasn't really interested. He kept trying to buy her drinks, and... Um, he followed her out of the bar, and, and by this time, uh, for protection, Bonnie had picked up a gun because uh, she had been an, an abuse victim, and her third ex-husband had been stalking her. And uh, the fellow in the bar uh, made statements that Bonnie found threatening, like, I'm going to blank you up. Uh -huh. I don't know how much you can say on the radio, <laughs> but I think you get the picture. Yes. And he, he said that repeatedly with violence in his voice, and he made a gesture or went for something in his pocket, and Bonnie fired what she said was a warning shot, but the uh, woman, the, the man pulled the pregnant woman in front of him as a human shield. The bullet went into her shoulder and into her lung, and she died. So Bonnie was charged with premeditated murder of this woman, Joyce Amos, who was actually trying to uh, pull the man, whose name I believe was Hector Freeman, away from Bonnie. Uh -huh. So she had tried to be a good Samaritan, and she ended up getting killed. The prosecutor at the time, uh, James Thomas, grossly overcharged Bonnie with premeditated murder rather than manslaughter. If she had done... Charged with manslaughter, she might have gotten 20 years out in 10. Instead, she was sentenced to 45 years, uh, which was the longest sentence of any woman in Connecticut history at the time. Wow. And they uh, tried to put together a fake drug case against her. She had had uh, some bulk products. I forgot what they were, but they're used to mix drugs or they're used for household stuff that she got from Costco, and uh, there were no drugs in her house, but they were able to get a seizure of her house, which took all her money, and she couldn't afford a private lawyer. Wow. Um, and then she had an inexperienced public defender who uh, didn't put forward anything about her battered history, no evidence. So she was just this poor black woman a victim of a great deal of circumstance, and then here you come as an investigative journalist. Yeah, I learned about the case after a while, and I kept on obtaining documents. The big smoking gun document that turned the tables, I called the Blue Note, because I thought it was a good, good title, like the Blue Note Records or Blue yes. Note Jazz <laughs> Club or whatever. It was written by Judge John Blue, who became famous because of the Cheshire murders. But he wrote it when he was a public defender, uh, just a couple of years after Bonnie was put away. And it detailed the poor job done by the public defender that she had ineffective assistance of counsel. Uh, it's like just a five-page memo, but it's filled with a punch on it, every line about malpractice. And it, it's a great document. 
but that never came out until uh, I published it in the spring of 2013. And you published it in what? The New Haven Register. Because you, uh, you were a writer for a, that. A columnist and contributing editor. Yes. So you're not just any old kind of reporter. Like, you are considered one of the best investigative reporters out there. And that means what? Like, when you are investigating, what does that mean for you? Well, it means I've taken an interest in something, and I think maybe I can... Uh, uh, get the job done, but uh -huh. I usually fail. And how do you, how do you, why do you say that? Because usually you write about injustice and nothing happens. This is the one case when something, in which something happened. A, a big something. Right. Yeah, after the memo was published, the State Board of Pardons and Paroles reversed the decision and granted Bonnie a clemency hearing, and then she was let out. That's the short version. Okay. So when that happened, how did your life change? Well, I was pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's nice that uh, I was kind of bewildered because uh, usually things don't work out right. I mean, it's not like the system worked or things worked out right for Bonnie. She, she should have been out maybe 17 years ago or 19 years ago instead of serving 27 and a half years. Uh -huh. you know. But as far as writing something and something actually happening, it was like a once-in-a-lifetime thing for me. Well, I mean, you're working on some stuff now, but before we get there, so you have two books, right? You have two well, books. I have several. I have uh, two books of columns. I have a, yes. A, a, one is called Law and Justice in Everyday Life. And the other one is More Cool Justice. The website is morecooljustice.com. And, and on that website, you do what? Well, that has a, it has a video explaining what the book's about. Uh -huh. And it has a YouTube page, including a news reports, uh, most primarily CBS 880 New York, about Bonnie getting out and the impact of the Blue Note. So tell me about the Cool Justice book, because that's the one you sent me. And uh, yes, and 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 what is this book about, and why? Well, this is a second book of columns, um, inspired by the Bonnie case, and it has a bunch of other cases and essays. Um, but on the cover, um, with this guy named Wilbert on the left, and he was a co-worker of Bonnie's at the factory called uh, Wire Mold, which I think was in. Bloomfield, and she lived in Hartford, and I'm in between Wilbert and uh, Wally Lamb the day Bonnie got out, so we're sharing a happy moment of hugs and stuff, and Chloe uh, from the Hartford Current let us use the uh, photograph in her buses. So now, are people calling you? Are you getting calls from people to like, can you look at this? Can well, you think about this? I, I, I get a steady... I, been getting a steady stream of stuff for decades based on earlier stuff I had done and uh, some stuff I can look at and most I really can't do anything about. So tell me about the, the earliest time when you realized investigative journalism was something you wanted to do. And then we'll talk, we'll talk about some cases, but yeah. I want to know what drives you to do this work because I don't think this is easy work. I don't, are you, do police, uh, law enforcement people like you? Do judges well, uh, and some do, attorneys some don't. like you? <laughs> uh, it's a mixed bag, you know, I mean, I've, I've got some friends and I've got some adversaries. And how does that make you feel? Like, are you nervous about the adversaries? Because you, because I know you do some mob investigation stuff and well, uh, some, some characters who are, who walk on the wild side a little bit. <laughs> I'd say that uh, um, I, I don't have any great concerns. I, I feel it, it makes me more awake and alert. Okay. Uh, I would say that my, my biggest concern is, is the government. Really? Yeah, I'd be more worried about the government than uh, 
old mobsters. So talk about that. Why? Well, that's, it's kind of a big issue, but I mean, we've we've got a little hint of it in the Whitey Bulger movie that's out now. Uh huh. With uh, Johnny yeah. Depp. Right. And right. I'm hearing good reviews about that. Have you seen it? Have yes. You see, yes. You've seen it, Ed? Well, um, I think it has its moments, but it's just a small piece of uh, of the of the real picture. Really. Really. <laughs> so, okay, before we talk more about this movie, when did you know, Andy, that you had a knack or a talent for investigative journalism? Because uh, you're a good-looking man, so you could have just gotten away with, you know, just writing anything and just being handsome. Well, that's pretty <laughs> sweet of you. Uh, I, I don't know what to say about that, but... Uh, <laughs> I started as a sports writer, uh -huh. uh, and I was a paper boy when I was a little kid, and I used to read the paper at 5 in the morning before everybody else. Like, it was a good treat, you know, to get the paper early. And prior to that, uh, my mother taught me how to read when I was a little kid and took me for walks in the woods, you know, like before I went to school. So I uh, gained an appreciation of books and, and nature. So that's the, the core foundation. And uh, she encouraged me to write for my high school paper. And then I got a job when I was 17 at the Norwich Bulletin and Groton News Sports Departments in Eastern Connecticut. My, my first story was Pee Wee Football Roundup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is charming. Yeah. And uh, on a trip with the Connecticut Sports Writers Alliance, I got to meet Yogi Berra when he was manager of the Mets, you know, wow. shake his hand. That was pretty cool. So that that had to be cool because if you are a sports writer, like he's yeah. he's larger than life. Yeah, he was just sitting at his desk being a good host, shaking hands with long lines of people, and I was one of the guys in line. Oh, that's yeah. so sweet. Yeah, yeah. sweet. And they have good food for the sports writers at these ballparks. So when did you make the leap from sports to investigative journalism? Well, um, it was a slow process. I. Uh, Went to school at Boston University during the Vietnam War, and Howard Zinn was my professor, the author of People's History of the United States. How cool is that? Kinda, Do you look back and think, oh, that's really cool? Well, he kind of turned my world upside down. And, uh, I spent a lot of time with him in his classes, and he wrote the introduction to my first book of columns, uh, Law and Justice in Everyday Yes, I, I, read, I read some of that. Yeah, and... Um, he, uh, like he, he would have guests from uh, lawyers for the Black Liberation Army that was actually killing cops on the street at the time. And they would explain that uh, in this uh, region, uh, the cops are not seen as friends of the people. They're seen as an occupying army. So I began to think, well, what's that all about? That's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not advocating anything like that. I'm oh, just I, I'm saying sure that you're not. Absolutely. Uh, but it, but that time, yeah. that was the time, right? That was, right. that was the time in which civil rights was just um, coming to its fullness and black power movement, and you know, it's sort of at the beginning of that. So. Yeah, and uh, he and Father Daniel Berrigan brought back the first POWs from Vietnam. Uh, and the State Department tried to stop them from going, and then they said, "You don't have a passport." And we said, "Well, we don't, we don't recognize uh, your right to try to regulate our travel." And then they tried to beg them to make them take a passport, and they wouldn't take it. But and then once they got out of Vietnam, they stopped at some intermediate place, and the U.S. government took over with the prisoners. But Howard was a direct action kind of guy. He taught it. Spelman or Spielman College in Atlanta. Uh-huh, Spelman. Yeah, and he got fired from there during the Civil Rights <laughs> Movement, and then he went to BU. So wow. he, he was a big influence on my life. Then when I came back home to eastern Connecticut, I worked as a town reporter uh, for the Norwich Bulletin. I covered uh, Lebanon, Connecticut, which had more cows than people. So 
So I'd hang out with farmers and learn about, you know, how they kept the cows milking and, <laughs> you, you know, they got a lot of extra cows besides the ones that milk are milking, the ones coming in and the ones going out. Okay, so how long did the whole rural, pastoral uh, Connecticut vibe Oh, last? I did that for about a year, yeah. and then uh, <laughs> somehow I became an editor for a while, and then uh, I had a boss who had been a, a Green Beret sergeant when he was 19, and uh, he taught me how to hang out with cops, and uh, so did another cop reporter. And those guys were John Peterson, my editor, and Harry Phillips, my friend, the cop reporter. And then Peterson had done groundbreaking work on the cover-up of a hit-and-run death in New London on Christmas Eve 1973, in which a former mayor and a judge were involved at various levels in the cover-up. So you, so you, have, you are finding your way into the world of corruption. Right? right. I learned a lot as a young reporter uh, covering a grand jury investigation into the death of Kevin Showalter, which named former Mayor Harvey Malov as the probable driver, and his best friend, Judge Santanello, uh, Angelo Santanello of New London, who controlled the early stages of an investigation, uh, was caught on tape tipping him off that he's a suspect. So I've learned how the things work or don't work at the state and local level in terms of law enforcement. So what and did that do for you? Like when, when, you, when you got a taste of that, yeah. what did that do to your sense of, because you, you, know, you're, you're, you learned under Zen yeah. and you came up in this Vietnam era and then here you are getting a taste of corruption. Mm -hmm. What does that do for you? What did that do to you? Well, it, it, it makes you realize that all the stuff they teach you in a, as a little kid about civics is a big lie, that, you know, the government works for you and they're the servant of the people. You realize that's all crap. So did it depress you or did it instill something else in you? Did it excite or awake something else in you? I think both things, you know, uh, was a, a bad realization. Because I think, you tell me, um, when you, it's sort of like the Wizard of Oz. You think Oz one way until you see the, she the man behind the curtain. That's and you're right. Like, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> there are men behind the curtain. Yes, there are men behind the curtain. So how do you keep yourself, how did you, how did you continue? Because you could have said, oh, this is too much for me. Let me turn around. Well, at various times in my life, I have said, this is too much for me. i got to take a break. Or uh, things happen and you take different turns. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or around that time, uh, early, early in my career, after I worked on a hit-and-run case, uh, uh, I, I was w with my, my sister, who is younger than me, and my mother, who was 57, uh, and she had a long battle with camp cancer, and she succumbed at that age. So uh, I felt pretty messed up at that time, so I had to take a break. Uh -huh. Rightly so. And uh, then I gradually uh, made a comeback. I was editor of a weekly paper in Mystic, the Mystic Compass, and um, we actually had a weekly paper in Norwich for a while called the Rose City Sentinel. And, and at the time we had six full-time reporters, which many daily papers don't have that anymore. Right. You know, so we, we had some fun for a couple of years. And then I was an editor at a daily paper in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, the Times leader. Then I came to Stanford, Connecticut, Hartford Current, a few other places. You know. And you still, you still hold, um, writing gigs at a, a great many places. Well, I I had a, two years with the New Haven Register Group, and they, like many other big companies, are uh, in the crapper financially. <laughs> you know, they've been in bankruptcy court twice. The owners of the Hartford Current are in bankruptcy court or trying to sell off. So I, I got cut out of the budget. Uh, 
But uh, early this year, I worked for uh, about six months for NBC out of New York covering the Boston Marathon bombing trial. So and how I, was that? How was that? Well, it's pretty exasperating in that the more I learned about it, I feel the less I know about it. But I worked with a great crew of people, uh, hardworking, uh, good, good team players. Like even the big shots work hard and do do the the tough work and share the load. You know, it's, did the government get inspired. it right? Did we get it right? Are we getting it right with that whole terrorist? Uh, I don't think painting so. Painting them as terrorists. And no, I mean. During that trial, the, an FBI t agent testified they didn't know who made the bomb or where it was made. So do you think the American public can hear those kinds of truths? Or do you think we've already made our mind up based on the media's massaging of the story? Uh, certainly, um, I think more people watch entertainment tonight than investigative reporting. So uh, we didn't get get it right on the Boston Marathon. There's still a lot of uh, unanswered questions there. So do you think it's done? I mean, no one is going to go back in. There's a real good book by a woman named Masha Gessen, G-E-S-S-E-N, called The Brothers. She's a woman who covered the trial. I thought uh, the girl from the Dragon Tattoo flew in. She's, she's just really cool. Uh, she was a big LGBT activist in Russia, uh -huh. and uh, she got fired from a magazine because she wouldn't cover an event by Putin. And then she went had a meeting with Putin, and he offered her the job back, and she said, no, thanks. And uh, she wrote a book about Putin, Putin and she wrote a book about uh, that group Pussy Riot in Russia. Yes, who, so, who uh, they sent those women to prison. Yeah, so, I mean... Uh, You'll read things in that book that you haven't read elsewhere about the tr the travels of the older Sarnaev brother who was uh, on a no-fly list but traveled freely to Chechnya and Russia before the bombing. That's interesting. Yeah. So did that story, did that whole scene give you pause or what did it do for you? Well, it's almost paralysis because... Uh, the judge, uh, George O'Toole, did everything he could to keep the public out of the trial. They didn't let anybody in the courtroom at all during the beginning of jury selection. And then after some squawking, they let two reporters in the courtroom and the rest watch it on closed circuit TV. So it was a big effort to discourage coverage by the press and attendance by the public. Because they... They wanted to get this done. Well, in any prosecution, there's a limited story. Everybody has their story. The prosecution has a story. The defense has a story. Whether it has anything to do with reality is another question. So do you think uh, we as Americans get it right about terrorism and how we think about terrorism and how we think about the people we believe who are carrying out the acts of terror? No. Well, let me give you an example. Uh, everybody wants to beat on Iran, right? Yes. So this is where we fail at history. Iran had a democratically elected government uh, during the Truman years. And the, I'm reading a book, another book called The Brothers, coincidentally. Masha, Masha Gessen's book is The Brothers about Sarnaev's brothers. And there's a retired New York Times report reporter named Stephen Kinzer, who wrote the brothers about the Dulles brothers, who ran the State Department and the CIA, beginning with Eisenhower. But they overthrew the democratically elected government of Iran, principally because they had nationalized the British oil, right? And then they put in the Shah. So why would anybody in Iran like or trust America? And it's like, we come off like we're righteous and clean against Iran, we're the ones who messed up Iran. <laughs> so, I mean, how can you possibly believe anything the government says about stuff like that? So why doesn't the everyday American person give bigger thought to these kinds of issues? Well, I think uh, there's a lot of people in the know. You just don't see them on the media or hear about it. 
you know, regular people aren't stupid. They, uh, they know when their local or state or federal government's lying to them. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So what do you think of the media these days? All there, of there's it. not much left. And uh, thank goodness there's the New Haven Independent or other independent news organizations supported by the community. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you have to read a lot to get the picture. If, just as a simple example, you got the Drudge Report for the right and the Huffington Post for the left, and from there you can branch off to other things if you want to know what's going on nationally or internationally. So, where do you fit in all of this? Well, um... I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to think of what to do next. I'm, I'm semi-retired since around uh, 05 when I uh, had a couple surgeries and chemotherapy. and um, So I'm not 100%. I got uh, a few things that slow me down. But I work part-time when I can get an assignment. Uh, if you just tuned in, you're listening to Love Babs, Love Talk. I am Babs Rawls-Ivy. And I'm talking to Andy Tebow, who is an amazing investigative journalist and who I'm enjoying this conversation. And this is being live streamed at uh, www.newhavenindependent.org. And we are WNHHLP 103.5. And uh, I'm talking to Andy. And uh, so tell me, because I want to I wanna get to this case, because we were talking offline uh, before we got on air. We were talking about this this case in the uh, the Badaraco case, the Badaraco case, and you want to read something because I think this is this is this is Grishamish esque. I mean, this is this is something for you. <laughs> this, this is about uh, Mary Badaraco who disappeared. This will keep you up at night. Yeah, maybe thirty some years ago, and uh, when the state police came to her house, they found a smashed windshield but they didn't follow up on it, and that, that car of hers disappeared later on. There were a couple developments in the past few years, and I'll, 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 I'll try to introduce it by reading a, a minor update I had for a column uh, that ran in the New Haven Register Group January 13, 2014. Uh -huh. The headline is, Someone blew up justice in Badaraco homicide case. And the editor's note or update says, the state judicial review council voted Wednesday not to discipline retired judge Robert Brunetti for misconduct. Judicial review council chairman Wayne Keeney told the Danbury News Times that Brunetti's leak of grand jury information to homicide suspect Dom Dominic Badaracco and their mutual friend Ronald Rocky Richter occurred too long ago for the disciplinary unit to take action. So the statute of limitations for ethical misconduct citation against the judge for leaking grand jury information in a criminal case had passed. Wow. Now you said something to me that there's no over there's no there's there's no there's no oversight of judges or prosecutors in Connecticut, and I'll give you one proof, one example to prove that. And the headline on this is "Persons Known and Unknown Blew Up Justice in Badaraco Homicide." They were blowing ju up justice all the time in this case. And I, I'll just, uh, here's a, a sub-headline, How Judge Survived Grilling on Golf Game. <laughs> and I, I got a quote from uh, Shakespeare, Julius Caesar, Act 3, Scene 2. For Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. And here's a quote from a, a, sta a state senator from Danbury, about Judge Brunetti, quote, you are a Danbury man who we are, we are very proud of for your service. This column ran uh, June 10, 2013. Imagine the pressure of being grilled in public by a legislative committee 
just to keep your job for another eight years. Somehow, Judge Robert Brunetti of Goshen survived this ordeal in April 2010. At the time, Brunetti seemed pretty juiced about serving another eight years. Then something happened. A revived state police investigation into the killing of Mary Badaracco, one of Connecticut's most notorious cold cases, generated tremors throughout this state's law enforcement, court, and political establishments. The readers should know this well. Those establishments are all one and the same. At Brunetti's confir confirmation hearing, State Senators Andrew McDonald, now a State Supreme Court Justice, and Dan Barry's Michael McLaughlin asked the only questions. First, McDonald. And this is his question. Thanks for your patience this morning. Worth it for an eight-year term, though, I guess, right? And Judge Brunetti responds, yes. Wow, that was rough. The committee version of a brushback pitch to keep the batter on his toes. <laughs> Who would drop the heavy artillery on the unsuspecting judge? McLaughlin, thank you, Judge, for your service to the state. I, I guess we're all feeling better about our golf game, knowing that Judge Satter is still playing and enjoying the game, and knowing that you're an accomplished golfer. I hope that means good success for you, both on the bench but also on the golf course. I just want to let the residents of our state know that, that you are a Danbury man, who we are very proud of for you we are very proud of for your service, both as a state's attorney and now as a judge, and we, we wish you well in your continued service to the state. Who knew, if not for Brunetti's reputation as a good golfer, he might not a, have ever made it, even made it through this tortuous process. <laughs> we can only hope other state workers never have to endure such a grilling. <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you know this, Andy, when you when you see the blatant disregard for the rule of law, yeah, and and then they do this all slap each other on yeah. the back thing. But what does that do? What does that do for you? Well, it shows how the the system works for those in the system who the system serves itself. They don't teach you that in civics class when you're a kid. You know, I don't. Do they even teach civics anymore? I, I don't know. I don't I think know. they do. I don't think they do anymore. I that was my favorite class civics. I loved it. But so, what do you what do you think of this whole mob and the romanticism of the mob in this country? I mean, we we are fascinated by that whole. Well, world. I, th I think the mob is just the personification of corporate business as usual. I mean, uh, corporations kill people. I mean, uh, the United Fruit Company used to run Guatemala, and then this goes back to the Dulles Brothers, you know, uh, and the Guatemalan people elected a president that tried to take land in Guatemala from the United <laughs> Fruit Company, right? <laughs> so so uh, when the Dulles Brothers ran the CIA, they were able to... Uh, the CIA and the State Department, they ran the overt and the covert foreign policy of the United States of America, and they were able to serve their corporate clients from the law firm Sullivan and Cromwell, which they ran, including United Fruit Company, and overthrow the government of Guatemala. So we are a nation of organized crime. That's right. <laughs> and these same people used the mob to try to kill Fidel Castro. So, I mean, who's on what team, right? Who's on what team in the Whitey Bulger case or the Boston FBI office or the Boston U.S. Attorney's office? Is it stunning to you that he was allowed to sort of, and I'm, and I'm deliberately using the word allow, to be as free as he was? For Who, as Whitey long, Bulger? Yeah, for as long as he was. I mean, how, how is that possible? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know enough about that case. I mean, there some people at the Boston Globe probably know a lot more. Uh -huh. Or the guys who wrote the Black Mass book, which was the basis for the movie. Yeah. So what keeps you up at night these days? What's keeping you up? Like, what is turning your soul over? 
My dog has a tumor. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so that's, that's what but I'm I concerned about. I know pet about. people, and they, yeah. they are quite, you know, strong with their pets, so. Yeah, well, it's good to have somebody you can talk to who understands you. you know? <laughs> is there any case out there that you want to look into that is calling your name? Well, I think this Badaracco case clearly is unresolved. Um, 37 years. Well, I mean, you've got a judge who leads grand jury information to a murder suspect, right? And he got this information from other judges at lunch. And so the thinking is, if he does that, if, if, he, if the judge is doing that, the outcome has to be what? Cases uh, bollocks, as they say, or, you know, some other words I couldn't say that I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, the case is fixed. A lot of cases are fixed, and that's one of them. So what would be the reasoning for her to be missing? Like, what, did, what do you think? Somebody killed her. Why? Um, Do you have any thoughts on why they would kill her? I mean, I, I just know enough about these kinds of movies that maybe she knew something, she saw something, she was ready to tell something. Or maybe she was just irritable. Oh. I don't know, you know. I don't know why she was killed. So it's a cold case. Is anybody ever working on it? I don't think cases are ever really cold, uh, right? Somebody's always thinking about it or working on it. I'll just say this. In, in uh, many departments where there are cold cases or cases that are bollocks, there are good and honest cops who uh, try to do the right thing and try to do the job, but they get stopped. And so do you find yourself drawn to this case? Like are you going to spend some time in it? or? Well, uh, the... There are a number of cases I'm pursuing that uh, after a while you take a break from banging your head against the wall and, you know, give it a rest and go on to something else. To anything stuff. you want to share or anything you... Oh, well, I, I have a, a missing person case that's more than 40 years old that I think is kind of interesting. Wow. Um, but you have to really be organized. Well... And tenacious. I don't give any evidence of being organized. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see yourself as um, a modern day freedom fighter? Do you see yourself as a superhero? How do you uh, see yourself? I mean, this is good work. So you have uh, to be thinking, what? Well, they don't, you don't like uh, it? Or the superhero uh, moniker doesn't fit? What? Uh, that's very uncomfortable just hearing you say that but um i'm just i know how how to write a story uh, i know how to get information and sometimes i hope it makes a difference that's all that's all that, that's all i can do so when people call you and with inquiries about your services what do they say i get letters from people asking me to look into their case but i mean any case you look into, you might have uh, enough boxes of stuff to fill, fill a room, you know, uh, and then you got to put time into it. So you can, you can only do so many. You know? So now, is there an organization of investigative journalists? Like, is there a bunch of folks like you who get together annually and like... <laughs> well, I don't go to any of those conventions. Or, oh, there you know. are? Stuff? Well, there's... IRE, Investigative Reporters and Editors, uh, is an organization. There are similar organizations. I don't belong to any. Why? Why don't you belong? Well, I don't have the time or the money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just um, I worked part-time uh, you know, for the New Haven Register Group for a couple of years, uh, allegedly mentoring young reporters and writing a column, and that that took up most of the time and energy, energy that I had. And I occasionally do uh, private investigations part-time out of Hartford for a company called Integrated Security Services. And what is that like? Well, that's like you might interview witnesses who saw something related to a case. It's not uh, necessarily exciting. Uh, it's important, uh, good work. 
you know, for as an employee, you know. So when you do you watch any television? You know, I gave up watching cop shows after I watched The Wire. You know that show, The Wire, on HBO yes, about Baltimore, which had us all sort of yeah. I mean, riveted. To you can't it. take any cop show seriously after watching that, in my opinion, except for Bosch, B O S C H, which is an Amazon show about Harry Bosch, who's yes. a fictional LA cop. Yes. So uh, those are two shows I like. I like Treme. I like Treme too, although it got a little it got a little gritty for me, and I had to. Yeah. I'm only on the second season. I had to let it go. But my my old missing person cases from the New Orleans so I, I went down there a few times to work on it. That's an interesting city. It's got its own mystery right? It's got yeah. its own It's, it's like its own country Yeah, I mean, it's a whole vibe there that's different. There were the people who were there before the French sent uh, entrepreneurs and people from jail to try to get it together after and then there were at a certain time there were like i don't know a lot about this but i read a book the french quarter by the guy who wrote the gangs in new york there were all kinds of different groups like free people of color yes and uh yes the indians yes and then the spanish came in uh-huh and the pirates and you can see it all at mardi gras like yeah. you can see all the factions yeah. right but it's like a it's its own universe our own country it really is it's a di when you get there it as soon as you step foot in the city proper it has its own energy and vibe you know it's an uneasiness and a southern hospitality at the same time at least that's how i felt i think that's why i'm drawn to that city because it's dangerous but it's also genteel <laughs> yeah. you know it's seedy but it's highfalutin yeah, yeah. it's got that got that vibe to it so. I, I find i have to be alert and aware when i'm there yes but but yet you can still drink you know what i mean like <laughs> you're alert and aware but yet you drink you know because it's like that i usually know? have somebody keeping me company to look out for me <laughs> so when you're doing the private detective thing or investigative thing mm -hmm. um what would you share with people that you think they get wrong about investigative journalists? Because, you know, we watch CSI, and we watch all these great shows. and I what's... never watch CSI, so okay. I don't know. All right, how... then you won't know then. I mean, uh, I don't know what people think, but people think all kinds of things. All kinds of things? So, so what do you do for fun then? Tell me what you do for fun. Uh, I, I play ball with my dog, you know. She chases... Uh... <laughs> Racquetballs in my backyard. <laughs> I, I like to go to uh, jazz clubs when I can. And uh, Me too. Where do you like to go? What's your favorite jazz club? Well, I, I like to go to Black Eyed Sally's in Hartford. In Hartford, yes. And, um, I don't get to New York that much, but... Uh, there's a, a few places I'd like to go to there that I haven't gone to, like Smalls. Smalls, yes. Yeah. In Harlem. And uh, the Blue Note. Yeah. The Iridium. I was just at the Iridium a few months ago. I saw Stanley Clark. Oh, wow. I walked by there once. Uh, there's some place below Studio 54 called, I forgot what, under 54 or something. I, <laughs> I, I saw... Uh, woman from Israel, and at Cohen, play there. That's good? Yeah, yeah. She, That's good. I think she played the clarinet and maybe soprano sax. I'm trying to get to the Carlisle room. Yeah. You know, like to do the highbrow jazz, right? Yeah. <laughs> get all dressed up and, you some, know. Some places I don't get into very easily. Well, <laughs> I find that hard to believe. <laughs> I believe you could get into any place you want to get into. So, you know. So I think we have like, I don't know, how much more time do I have, Brian? We have a couple of minutes, so. So what are you working on now? Can you talk a little bit about what you got going on now? You don't have to give me well, details, uh, but uh, um, give me a sense. Uh, uh, I'm working on that missing person case from New Orleans. Uh, 
There was an executive for General Foods Corporation named Gabe Caparino, a Navy veteran who uh, went on a business trip for General Foods out of White Plains, New York, and never came back. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's a chapter four in uh, More Cool Justice. So who was asking you to do that? The family? The, the well, corporation? Uh, who? No, the <laughs> corporation didn't want anybody to know anything about it. Really? Yeah. They. Uh, How do they explain it? <laughs> they they tried to disparage his character and say that he took off, and uh, they denied uh, his wife benefits for many years. His widow even uh, had she had him declared dead, and she had to struggle to get the elementary benefits she was due, and. She had to go back to school and become a teacher and raise two daughters through college. Wow. She's still, uh, you know, uh, struggling in her mid to late 70s trying to find out what happened to her husband. Wow. So, you know, we, you and I talked uh, before we came in here about um, all the stories that you have and worked on that easily could be translated into movies and and, and mini series and, and, and television. Has that, have you been approached? Have you given some thought? Well, um, that hit and run case in New London was the inspiration for a Lou Grant episode, you know, the old Lou Grant TV yes. show. Um, and I, I haven't been approached for anything. Uh, I did co author a book called You Thought It Was More by a guy named Louis the Coin, the world's greatest counterfeiter. And uh, he uh, imported a printing press from uh, Italy to Providence. And uh, he made $100 uh, slot machine tokens that couldn't be detected. And he served two years at Fort Dix Federal Penitentiary, and then he was hired as an expert by the U.S. Mint. Okay, so... so so they just look in the phone book and find you to co author Like, how do you? Well, um, that's a story. That's its own. That's its own show right there. I had written a column uh, about Louis' adventures at uh, Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun. He took them for a lot of money. He took Las Vegas for a lot of money, but they denied it because uh, all the security <laughs> guys making a few hundred grand a year would have to admit they made a mistake. Oh my gosh! Now that's the that's a good story right there. It's a it's a book by Louis Colavecchio with and you. Franz Duski, <laughs> the, the gateway guy, and me. Uh, wow. We worked on it about eight or ten years. And, uh, called You Thought It Was More by Louis, L-O-U-I-S, Colavecchio, C-O-L-A-V-E-C-C-H-I-O. That is cool. Well, everybody, this is Andy uh, Thibault. And if you want to know more about him, go to www dot cool justice dot uh, more cool justice more cool justice dot com more cool justice dot com this was so entertaining thanks a lot and I enjoyed it so thank you all oh uh, keep in mind this is uh, October um, breast cancer awareness so um, get your uh, cancer awareness plan together so that you can take care of yourself this is also domestic violence month so talk to people openly about what's going on and uh, I'll see you all next week I don't know who I'm talking to but it's always going to be interesting. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Whiskey time.